Enlightened Living with Drs. Bryant and Lysandra Bell is brought to you by the faithful partners and friends of Enlightened Christian Center and viewers and listeners like you. Every mercy, every day, you know that we got that fame. We got that fame. We got that fame. I'm Bridget Bailey, and I'm an Enlightened Christian. We got that fame. 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 God is good, isn't he? Amen. He's good to you? My question is, are you good to him? All right. So we've been looking at this topic that we call ministering to the Lord. Ministering to the Lord. You know, we always want to be ministered to. We go to church and we're expecting to receive something. But every day that you wake up, God is looking to be ministered to by you. He wants to receive something. He wants you to tell him how good he's been to you uh, today. He wants to hear a thank you for all that he's done in your life. And it's important that we understand that our praise and our worship ministers to the Lord. God is always looking for the opportunity to be ministered to. Now, we've gone through a lot of scripture on this subject, and we're going to get through a lot more. So I want to say this. If you're here with me and you're not used to our church services, maybe this is your first time, this is a big boy, big girl message. This is not baby food that we're going to deal with today. Amen? So you are going to grow a lot today by leaps and bounds today. Say this, grow me up, Lord. All right, so you can go to church all over, and you can sort of get good messages, and they're, they're inspirational. This one may not make you shout. But this is going to make you groan. Amen? You're going to grow. So let's dig in. Now, we've already looked at these scriptures that I'm going to go over right here. So I'm just going to spot check them to catch some of you up, okay? In Acts chapter 13, verse number 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost says, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, notice what happened. He said, As we did what? Minister to the Lord and fasted. So God wants to be ministered to. He wants all of us to take time out of our lives, out of our schedules, and minister to him. Now, they did two things. They ministered to the Lord, and they fasted. Fasting doesn't minister to the Lord, and fasting doesn't give God anything. What fasting does is crucifies you, crucifies your flesh, crucifies your spiritual ear so you can hear from God, so you can be better at being obedient to God, so you can do the will of God. That's what fasting does. Fasting is not going to give you a breakthrough. You can pray and get a breakthrough. As a matter of fact, you can pray one time and get a breakthrough. And if you don't see your breakthrough after that one prayer, you can just start speaking the word to the thing that you're dealing with, and that will bring a breakthrough. You follow me? So, so our prayers and our faith confession, that will bring a breakthrough. What fasting does is fasting causes me to put on hold everything that's a distraction in my life. And in today's times, we have plenty of distractions to keep us from God's plan and from the heart of God. And so what fasting does is fasting crucifies my flesh by me telling myself, I'm not going to eat for a couple of hours or for a day or maybe three days. I'm not going to watch those things I've been watching on TV for a season. I'm going to set down my cell phone. That's probably the hardest fast in today's society. But I'm going to set down my cell phone. I fasted my cell phone once. It was hard. It was really hard because I wanted my phone, and it was not a legitimate fast because I actually lost my phone or my phone got broke or something, and so I couldn't pick it up anyway. But I fasted my cell phone, amen. I counted as a fast. And I'm going to tell you something. I had more peace during that time than ever before. I think people are stressed out because they're holding on to their cell phone too much. So fasting crucifies the flesh, allows me to get rid of my distractions. So, I, so when I minister to the Lord through prayer, and I mean through praise, through telling him how wonderful he is, I can actually focus on him and hear from him without any distractions. That's why they minister to the Lord, and that's why they fasted. Amen? Now what God is looking for is people, we said this recently, God is looking for people who will minister to him. The apostles ministered to the Lord, and since then, the question is, can God find anybody else to minister to him? That's what he's looking for. He's trying to find someone who will put him first and themselves second. And really, we're not even putting ourselves first 
as much as we're putting our friends first, we're putting our cell phone first, and we're putting all the distractions of the world first. And God is saying, can I find any one person who will put me first and who will minister to me? And now anytime we seek for something, that means that something at that season in life is extremely important to us. We really want that one thing. That's why we're looking for it. If you ever lost your keys and you're looking for your keys, you don't stop looking until you find them. Is that right? Why? Because that key is extremely important to you. If you've ever been looking for anything, a house, if you went house shopping, how many of you going house shopping before the year is out? Or how many of you believe in God to go house shopping at the next year? So you're going to go do some searching, right? I speak every blessing on you in your house search right now in Jesus' name. That you don't just find a house, you find the house that's the right house for you and your family in Jesus. One that the whole family will be satisfied with in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes the prophetic begins to flow in me, so I don't want to miss that. All right, so now if you've ever been house shopping, you go and you look for that house, and you don't want to settle for just any house. You keep looking and looking and looking until you find the right house. That's the God that we serve. God is looking and seeking for someone who will worship him. And when he's looking, he's not just looking at every church all around America. He's looking for the people in the church that will spend time with him without distraction. They will spend time. And let me tell you what God wants more than anything. He wants a person who will intimately get involved, worshiping him, spending time with him, serving him, ministering to him in praise, and in telling him how good he is. So I should say, in praise and adoration. Praise and adoration. Say that. Praise and adoration. That's what God is looking for. So if you look at John chapter 4, verse number 23, it says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Read the next part with me, ready? Read. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now, notice what he says. God the Father is on the prowl looking for somebody who will worship him in spirit and in truth. My question is, if he scours all the churches in America, if he scours all the churches in the world, will he find one church that has an entire body of believers who came to worship him? No, the answer is. And you know why? Because most people don't show up to the praise service. Amen. You got eight or nine elements to most churches. Prayer, praise, uh, announcements, offerings, video announcements in our church. Then you got uh, offering, special song, then teaching of the word. And then we got the, uh, the exit, the benediction, right? The altar call, then the benediction. So I put 10 things out there for one church service. You'll experience all those today. But my question to you is what part of that service actually ministers to the Lord? Praise and worship. So when I'm teaching the word, is the Lord getting anything out of that? No, I can't teach him. He is not going to learn a thing from me. If anything, as good as I may think I teach or any teacher is in this world, he still knows that that's still the foolishness of man compared to who he is. You follow me? So you can go and find your best preacher, best hooper, whatever you want, and they can't do nothing what, compared to what the Lord can do. If Jesus came on the scene, T.D. Jakes would be sitting down. Amen? It don't matter any of us. We'd all take a back seat. And we wouldn't even sit up in the front row because we'd have to question whether we were worthy enough for that. Then he would invite us to the front row and say, you are worthy because I made you worry, worthy. But the reality is, is that no man is smart enough to teach God. So the teaching portion of the church, that's for you. God doesn't get a thing out of it. The prayer time, you're talking to God, but he receives absolutely nothing. He doesn't sit there and say, oh, that prayer is so good. Oh, I'm just getting edified by their prayer. He gets nothing out of that. The altar call, the only thing God gets from an altar call is new people to care for. That's it. So now he got a whole new batch of folks to take care of, another mouth to feed, another home to buy, another car to get. I mean, he's just got a whole other mouth to feed, another group of people to spank and build up and get them where they need to be. I mean, come on, please, that's a lot of responsibility. 
There's only one time in an entire church service that's dedicated to God, and that's the praise service. The only time that God can get anything out of the entire service is during praise and worship. So when you're sitting in your car during praise and worship, when you're still at home saying, oh, I got a little bit more time before Pastor Bell's in the pulpit during praise and worship. When you are driving here saying, I don't want to go and hear another track during praise and worship. No matter what it is, when you are going in that direction during praise and worship, God is saying, I got everybody, everything, they got everything they need, but I get nothing that I need. Have you ever been, you single people out on a date, and you think, wow, love this person. They got everything going on, smart. Wow, got a great physique. Wow, head and shoulders above the rest. Wow, man, pretty. Or, or, in, the, or, in, the, or, in, the, or in the, you know, the, back in my day, it was, she fine. Wow, you know, all the things that you say. But when you get to the dialogue, they just do all the talking. You get not a word in edgewise. And so when you leave from that entire experience, you leave with what? And by the way, I've I only been on a date with my wife. She's sitting here. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but when you leave from that experience, you say what? They got everything, and I got nothing out the whole experience. That's how church is for most believers. God gets nothing, but you got everything. And he's saying, when am I going to get a people that's going to give me what I'm actually seeking for? I'm looking for such a people to worship me. That's the only thing I'm actually asking for out of a, an entire one and a half hour praise service is for someone to praise me during the service. And you can get everything else you want, but if you will just give me my moment, I will be completely satisfied. And when I'm satisfied, I will satisfy you. Amen? We found out that God created us to minister to him. The whole reason why you were created uh, in the flesh and why you, were, why you were formed in the flesh and created in the spirit is so that you can minister to the Lord. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 21 says, The people I have formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise. That formed word is the same way that God uses the word he formed Adam from the dust of the ground. That means he made his flesh, his earth suit. And what he's saying is those people shall praise him. So God created or formed you to praise him. Then when in Psalm 102, he says this, the people, verse number 18, the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. So now that shall be created means what? These are the people that are going to be born again. So he's talking, one, about the in the flesh. That could be everybody, including sinners, who can praise God. And then in the second one, he's talking about those who are created. That is those who have been created as a new creature in Christ. He's saying, you've been created to praise God. So now God takes praise personally. He means this. Praise is the most important thing that God could ever receive. He is trying his best to get one thing from every believer, and that's a moment of praise. At home, when you're in your uh, uh, quiet time, don't just turn on your jazz music and your rap music and your hip-hop music and just go and start dancing, but turn on some, some, some quiet music or just shut the house down and make it all quiet and just give God the glory. Just magnify him and lift him up. When you come into the church service, don't avoid the praise service. Find your way into the praise service. And I like to tell everyone, you know, you're supposed to lift your hands and lift your voice, but why don't you close your eyes so you can keep from being distracted? And when you do that, you'll begin to give God praise. He'll begin to be glorified. He'll be magnified, and you will benefit from those moments alone with the Lord. The Lord has been with me, pulling me out of my bed at 3 in the morning. So right now I'm just on a 3 o'clock kick. It doesn't matter. And let me tell you something. When the Lord is tugging on you, he does not care what you have to do the next day. I have learned that. He could care less that you got to be at work as if your work really matters that much to him. Well, Lord, I'm just kind of tired. I don't feel like rolling out that bed. And I can tell you there are many times like that. And so last Sunday, he did this. The Sunday before last, he did this. He doesn't care. Well, you know what? I got to be at church at five. I got to give at five to be at church on time to be prepared. He doesn't care about that. As far as he's concerned, I need you downstairs, I need you in your living room, and I need you to minister to me right now. And let me tell you what I, what I did this morning. I got ready to roll out the bed, my feet hit the floor, and my wife said, oh, you about to go spend your daily fellowship with the Lord? I said, yep, about to go spend my daily fellowship with the Lord. And she said, okay. She was just getting to bed. I was waking up. <laughs> and then I just went down and spent time with the Lord. And let me tell you, God wants to do that in all your lives. I had one of my members tell me last Sunday, they said, Pastor, I got up and I was headed down to talk to the Lord. My wife saw me. He woke me up around three. My wife saw me and said, what in the world are you doing? He said, I'm going to minister to the Lord, going to pray, going to seek God. And she looked at him like he was crazy. It doesn't matter how people see you. 
It doesn't matter what they think about you. The most important thing is what you think about the Lord. And the, second, the most important thing is what the Lord thinks about you. The second most important thing is what you think about the Lord. It's important that you value what the Lord values. If the Lord values his praise, his moments with you, you should value your moments with him. Let me tell you, my wife, I love, you know, marriage is like a relationship we have with the Lord. It's a covenant. And marriage is not a contract. Marriage is not a prenup. None of that's important with God. But marriage is a covenant with the Lord. And my wife and I have been married now 30 years. And it's one thing that I've learned that I really love about being married is the closeness that you develop over time. And when you really become one, every bit of closeness is important. You'll start noticing this as you're married long enough. But, you know, you could be laying in the bed, and then you'll notice, hey, you know what? My wife is over there. My, 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 your husband is over there. And you'll just reach your hand out just to touch them because just that little touch brings a closeness there. You know what I'm talking about? You'll reach your foot across the bed. My wife likes to sleep with a heating pad somewhere in that bed, so it's always somewhere. So I, I reach over, and I feel the heat from the heating pad, and then I say, okay, so she's close by, and now I got to maneuver around the heating pad to get my foot to touch her. But then you just want to touch. In marriage, you just want to get close sometimes. I'm not talking about beyond that. I'm just talking about close. Sometimes you just want to go sit on the couch next to your spouse. I just want to sit next to you. I just want to scoot next to you. Why? It's something about that closeness that means something. It's the same way with the Lord. The Lord wants to be close to you. He seeketh someone who will worship him. Why? Because worship is intimate with God. You see, worship, true worship from the heart, is not something you can really give at a football game. You can't really just devote yourself. You might scream and yell, yeah, yeah. You can give them a shout. You can give them a praise, a hand clap. But the Lord with worship has to come from the Spirit. And that's something that God only owns. He's the only one who owns that. He has sole ownership of your spirit. So when you say, I'm going to worship you, every piece on the inside of you begins to come up and minister to the Lord. And he begins to feel that emotion that's coming from you. He begins to feel that relationship that's coming from you and he says oh yes I can have it I can inhabit that and wrap my arms around that Amen. you follow me so God is seeking that he's looking for that he's looking for that the question is can he find it can he find it God created men man to minister to him that's what he's looking for and we know dead people don't praise God, right? Dead people can't praise God. Psalm 115, verse 17 says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. You know what? It doesn't matter about a dead man because dead people can't raise their arm. You can go and look at a casket all day. That arm is not going to be sticking up worshiping God. They just can't do it. The dead can't praise God. The dead can't give God glory. But guess what else? The spiritually dead cannot praise God. You see, how do you know if a person is dying spiritually? They won't praise God. They won't enter into the presence of the Lord. They won't come into the praise service. They'll have every kind of excuse to keep them from getting to the place where God wants to worship them. Let me give you some key telltale signs when a person is spiritually dying. They're the hindrances to ministering to the Lord. These are the hindrances. This is what hinders a person from ministering to the Lord. When you see these signs, you know that person is dying. Number one, distractions. We live in a world of distractions. And distractions, and distractions can come. The question is, are you going to yield to them? This phone can be a big distraction. You're on your way to minister to the Lord, and you get a ding, a ping, a notification, and now you've got to check your phone. And you know how demanding that phone can actually be because we get to a place in today's times when we can be talking to an, a, an, on a job interview with someone and get a notification and start pulling it out, and, and we're reading text messages, and, and the person is looking at us like, really? You're reading a text message in the middle of a job interview? But that's just how of a, that's what kind of society we live in. So distractions are there to keep you from ministering to the Lord. If you can't put the distractions down, then maybe you're spiritually dead. Number two is lack of knowledge. People don't have knowledge because they're not seeking God. They want to be preached to. They want to be, you know, the word says in the last days they shall not be able to endure sound doctrine. They want to be preached to. They want to have a hoop. They want to have a style. And now ministries are built on style points and not word points. And so we're chasing ministries that are swelling and swelling and swelling because of all the sound, all the style. But let me explain something to you. Swelling means inflammation. 
Inflammation means it's not healthy. Anything that's inflamed is going to eventually be diseased. Amen. So we don't want an inflamed church. We want a word church or church that learns God's word and grows based on that word. Lack of knowledge. If you have lack of knowledge concerning what God wants ministerially from you, you're probably spiritually dead. Number three is seeking self-interest. I can't go because what I need is so important. I can't be there because what I need is so important. I can't go because what's, what I want, what I need, that's what's on my priority list. If you are seeking self-interest, then guess what? You're probably spiritually dead. This can't be about you. When people go to church, they got to stop going to church looking for a choir, looking for, you know, a certain style of music. you got to start going to church saying, it don't matter if they have music or don't have music. I'm going to get in the presence of the Lord today. I'm going to worship my God today because that's what he wants. My wife is not bashful about telling me the stuff she wants. I'm not bashful about going to get it for her. You know, a good marriage, the husband and the wife will make sacrifices for each other. You will know if the person loves you if they're willing to go the extra mile to get you what you want. There's every once in a while that I complain, I don't feel like going out in the middle of the night to buy my wife whatever it is she's trying to get. And it's like the middle of the night, I'm like, come on, really, can't you wait till tomorrow? And then she gives me that, oh, come on, honey, I really want this. And then I go out and I get it for a while because it's what she wants. Well, guess what? That's how God is. Now, the question is, I don't want God whining trying to get a praise for me. So if I give him one every day, he won't have to whine looking for it. Amen? Spiritual negligence is the, is the fourth one. Some people are just spiritually negligent. You ever seen someone who's negligent? It's like they know what to do, but they just don't get it done. That's negligent. Like changing the tires on your car. You just keep on riding with them and riding with them and riding with them. You don't change them. Then you get a flat on the side of the road, and now you got to call whatever it is to come take care of that and get you told you've missed half a day of work or whatever, whatever meeting you were supposed to be in. You've missed that because you were negligent. And God is saying he doesn't want us to be negligent with praise because when we're negligent, we miss the benefits of ministering to the Lord. There are some benefits that come with ministering to the Lord. How about this one? This one will show you that you're really dead is ungratefulness. You know, a lot of people are ungrateful. But, you know, when we praise God, we should be looking back at everything he's ever done for us. Don't be ungrateful when, 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 uh, because you don't have this. you got to think about what you do have. And then it may have been better in the past. Well, you've got to dwell on some of that to know, okay, if it was better in the past, he'll do it again. I like that song we sing up here sometimes, uh, he'll, uh, what, what, he, he Can Do It Again. I love that because I realized that no matter how good it was in the past and how bleak it might be looking right now, God can make, every, he can make something out of nothing every single day of the week and never run out of something from the nothing he made it from. You know, Jesus feeding the 5,000 with, with fish and loaves, let me explain something to you. He really didn't need fish and loaves to do it with. He could have done that with air. And you got to understand, you might say, I'm down to my last. I'm, I really have nothing. No, what you have is your last and a thank you, your last and a praise, your last and a worship. And if you give him both of those, the last thank you, last praise, last worship, he will begin to take that nothing and turn it into something for you. And you'll have 12 baskets of blessings left over at the end of it. Amen? The other one is hindered opportunities. When the opportunities are hindered, we got to learn how to press through. So things are not working like they should work. Press through. Look at your neighbor and say, press on through. Don't let the hindrance stop you. You got to keep on pushing through the hindrances. There's always going to be a hindrance. And what the devil is good at is seeing, charting you. Oh, they will quit because of this? Do that again. They'll quit because of that? Keep on doing it. And he'll keep running the same game on you until you figure out the game. Amen? You got to figure out his game and press on through and stop letting him hinder you from the blessings that the Lord has for you. Now, here's what else I want to share with you. God honors those who minister to him. Now, when we talk about ministering, what do we mean? Spending time alone with the Lord, intimately involved with him, adoring him and praising him. Adoring him and praising him. Praise and adoration. I'm just going to spend time with him. I'm just going to adore him. I'm just going to give him that. I'm not asking him for anything. Hello, there's a place and time for that. Yes, there's a place and time to say, Lord, I need this. Would you take care of that? But I need to spend some time that I don't ask for anything. Just because you got him in your presence don't mean you have to ask him for it. Amen? Sometimes you just need to talk to the Lord. 
He just wants to be close right now. The word says, draw nigh unto the Lord, he'll draw nigh unto you. Amen? But just to be close is what he's saying. Just to be close. Take a look at the scripture, John chapter 12, verse number 26. Let's put that on the screen. I want us to read this one together. Read this with me. Ready? Read. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Underline the word serve, in those two words serve in that scripture. I want to give you the definition of that word. That word serve is the Greek word diakonio. And it means in the Vines Dictionary, minister unto, to minister unto. Now, you won't get that in your everyday church, but you get that in enlightened. Now, I want you to get a hold of something. It means minister unto. So now when we read that scripture, he says, go back to that scripture. If you would, put it back on the screen. I want you to see what the scripture, what the scripture is actually saying. If any man will minister unto me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man minister unto me, him will my father honor. Notice what God is looking for. What did I tell you the most important thing is he wants? Us to minister to him. Us to take time out of our schedule and just minister to him. You can minister to him at your job. You can be ministering to him while you're typing, working, turning a wrench, whatever you do, flipping burgers, it don't matter. You can be saying, Lord, I just thank you, I bless you, I give you the glory, I give you the honor. But let me explain something to you, what he says in this scripture. If any man serve me, read the last part of that, ready, read. Him will my father honor. There's honor that comes from ministry. Good morning, world. My name is Corey Hall, and I'm an enlightened Christian. Did you see that service that we just had, that we just broadcast for you? Pretty awesome, huh? If you would like to see more services like that, you can search for us on YouTube, Roku, and Facebook. Just type in Enlightened Living. And also, if you would like to sow into our ministries to help further the gospel, text TV and a dollar amount to the number on the screen, and we will greatly appreciate it. Every Friday, we would like to start your day with prayer. So if you don't mind, I would like to pray for you. Lord, we thank you for blessing us another day. We thank you that you continue to give us the strength and wisdom to walk throughout the day, Lord, that you give us favor everywhere that we go, and we thank you that we're living in the best days of our life right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tune in every Friday at 7 a.m. to CW Atlanta. Have an enlightened day. Thank you for watching Enlightened Living with Drs. Bryant and Lysandra Bell. Don't wait too long to come visit one of our church services. We meet Sunday mornings at 7.30 and 10.30 and Wednesday evenings at 7. You'll find us in the great city of Marietta, Georgia. Can't make it to church? Watch us live or on demand on Roku or on our website at ecclive.org. You can also watch us by downloading our app. It's free. It's easy. Just search Enlightened Christian Center on Google Play or on the App Store. You can also listen to our podcast on iTunes. Don't forget to follow, like, and share our social media pages. We look forward to keeping in contact with you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Feel free to send your love through prayers and financial support. Until next time, if anyone asks why you're so amazing, tell them, I'm an enlightened Christian.